Labrīt! Šajā augstajā ziemas rītā augsts godātais valsts prezidenta kungs, Latvijas vēstnieku kungs Dānijā, profesori Richardson, dargie kolēģi. Mēs turpinām tradīciju, kas ir iedibināta šeit lielajā aulā. Tie ir valsts prezidenta lekcija cikls ar nosaukumu pasaules līderu lasījumu. Šobrīd mūsu rindās ir lektori no Dānijas, un es lūkšu Zatler kungu teikt dažas vārdas ievadām. Lūdzu. Godājies projektori kungs, godātie profesori, mācības spēki, studenti, cienītās dāmas, godātie kungi. Man liels gandarījums, kad mums notiek kārtējā lekcija, valsts prezidenta viesa lekcija ciklā, tā problēmām, kas interesē mūs kā pasaules pilsoņus. Un Latvija, protams, tiek uzskatīta par zaļu, un mēs paši uzstām par zaļu zemi. Tas ir mūsu mantojums, tie ir mūsu meži un pļavas, un mēs esam pieraduši pie zaļās krāsas, kā dominējošās krāsas, arī mūsu domāšana, Faktiski ir zaļā domāšana, kā tas izpaužās ikdienā, ir cits jautājums. Bet tas ir mantojums, un tā ir šodiena. Ja mēs gribam pāriet tikai no zaļās filozofijas aizstāvēšanas dažādos protestos, pie reālās zaļās filozofijas, kā mūsu dzīves pamata filozofijas, ir vajadzīgs plāns. Plāns, kas nav dažām dienām, dažiem gadiem, Plāns, kas ir vairāk kā desmit garumā. Un tas ir tas, kas šobrīd Latvijā pietrūkst. Mūsu īstenībā nav plāna pat tuvākajai enerģētikas politikai tuvākajiem gadiem. Un tas ir ropas, kas jāaizpilda pēc piespējas ātrāk. Un šodien man ir prieks, ka mans viesas ir Dānijas klimata komisijas vadītāja Katrīna Richardsona. Kāpēc? Dānijai ir plāns. Ļoti ambiciozs plāns līdz 2050. gadam. Un ne tikai ideju līmenī, bet arī jau pasākumu, stratēģija, arī ar ieteikumiem, politiķiem, valdībai, kā to panākt. Panākt, ka mēs ne tikai idejiski esam zaļa valsts, bet panākt to, ka visa sabiedrība dzīvo pēc zaļās dabas likumiem. So, I have a great honor today to have a very special guest, Catherine Richardson from Denmark, and emphasize once again from Denmark, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, Latvia has always been a very green country because of geographic position, because of nearly 70% of forests, because of uh, producing at least nearly 40% of electricity by renewable energy, that means hydro. So we have used a very green philosophy and we are green people. But it's not enough because that's a heritage. That's today. That's our ideas. We need a plan. We need a strategy for more than two generations. And Denmark has a plan. And I am very happy that the highest expert on this field is my guest today. And honorable professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It's a great honor for me to be here today, and I'm especially delighted to see so many students. I have to say, I think that we are living in an incredibly interesting time. And you people have a tremendous job on your shoulders. I'm not going to stand here like so many people do and say, oh, well, our generation made a real pig's ear of this, and you know, we didn't do it very well, now you guys should do it better. Quite honestly, I think that my, our generation, has done it as well as we could, given what we knew. But now we know a whole lot more, and you're all here at the university to get that kind of knowledge. And uh, with the knowledge that you have, you have the power to do something differently. And I, before I actually talk about our energy plan, which is what I'm here to tell you about, I want to set the scene a little bit. Oops, is this, does this sort of go all by itself that we get it up there? 
I've had a wonderful helper for an hour making this happen for me and now it isn't where I want it to be. <laughs> How did this happen? Anyway, I want to set the scene a little bit that so far so good and I'll get it up there. <laughs> Yes, well, anyway, one of the reasons that I'm, um, uh, I'm here because I was chairman of the, of the Climate Commission in Denmark, but in addition, um, I actually do research, I'm an oceanographer, and I study the, um, the amount of CO2 that comes from the atmosphere and down into the ocean, and what it is in the ocean that controls, controls how much CO2 comes out of the atmosphere. In fact, the ocean has taken up between a third and a half of the extra CO2 that we humans have put into the atmosphere sphere and I study whether it's going to be able to continue. In that sense, I want to do a little bit of advertising here. I have a book along with 12 other authors um, coming out here this month and it is an interesting book. It's a different kind of a climate change book because it has 17 chapters and only four are about the climate system or the earth system itself. It also deals with the economics of it, the geopolitics of it, the ethics of it, and, and, and so on. And so I would like to do a little advertising here. But before I tell you about our energy um, plan, I want to set the scene a little bit. I want to kind of set the scene by taking my starting point as a researcher and you know what do researchers think about climate change. Well first of all it's very very seldom that changes in scientific understanding have the kind of Ugh! reaction in society that climate change does. Mostly, as scientists, we're allowed to go and do our thing and nobody really cares. But with climate change, ooh, everybody has a meaning. I wonder why this is. And I tried to think back. When would be the last time that a change in scientific thinking had the same kind of ooh, reaction in society? I think probably it was in 1859 when Darwin came with his book on the origin of species. Now what did Darwin do? Darwin challenged the way we think about ourselves as a species on this planet and our relationship with nature. The Bible had taught us that we were better than nature. We were above nature. We should civilize nature. I mean in Exodus it even says we're supposed to control the poor old fish. And then this scientist comes along and he says no no no, 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 we're not above nature. We're a part of nature. We're a species, just like every other living organism. In fact, we're an ape species. Ooh. Now that one was a really big pill, bitter pill to swallow for most people. But he did something else. He challenged the economic paradigm of 1859. Because in 1859, there were very many men, and I'm sorry to say, ladies, that it was all men then. But in 1859, there were very many men that didn't think you could have economic growth or economic stability if you didn't have slaves. Now what happens when a scientist comes along and says, those aren't animals you're selling, it's your brothers. Kind of takes the carpet right out from underneath it, doesn't it? So what's similar about Darwin and climate change? Well most of us, 150 odd years after Darwin, have pretty much accepted the fact that we are a species, that we are an ape. That is to say, unless we live in Kansas and they haven't accepted it yet. But, but most of us have pretty much accepted the fact that, that we are a species. But the next step the step of saying that the combined activities of that species are enough to change the way the whole world actually works. Look, that's a really bitter pill to swallow. People have a very hard time accepting that. And of course the other thing is, what was it we exchanged the slaves for? Machines. We replaced them by machines. What powered the machines? Fossil fuels. So we believe today that it's impossible to have economic growth 
or economic stability if we don't have access to fossil fuels. In fact, we're in exactly the same place, you could argue, that our ancestors were in 1859. But do scientists really have any evidence, any real evidence, that humans impact the way this planet works? Well, in fact, they do, and it's not just a question of climate change. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read what all these graphs are. I'm going to tell you in just a moment. But the point is, they all start at the same place in 1759, and they all end in 2000. This is from a book I was a co-author on in 2004. They all describe something in the, that humans do or some human activity. Starting in the upper left-hand corner, we have population to the demographer. We have popula world population working, I'll go from left to right on, the th on the, all the levels, population uh, uh, GDP, growth in GDP, world GDP, direct foreign investment, next row damming of rivers, next water use, fertilizer consumption, third row numbers of people living in cities, uh, paper consumption, numbers of McDonald's restaurants as a form for, as a proxy for globalization. Transport, the number of motor vehicles, the number of telephones, and international tourism. And you can see there's been a massive explosion in human activity, both because of our technological advancement, but also because we've become so very many people. And this great expansion, we actually call the Great Acceleration, and it's occurred over the last 60 years. Now what happens if we look at the Earth system? Can we see any, re any response in the Earth to all this activity? Well, in fact, these figures are built up in exactly the same way from 1750 to 2000, and they all show something about the Earth system. The top three are all greenhouse gases going from left to right, CO2, nitrous oxide or laughing gas, and methane. In the next row, the size of the ozone hole, the temperature in the northern hemisphere, uh, flooding events. The third row, the numbers or the percentage of fish species that are um, commercially exploited, either overexploited or, or um, uh, exploited to their full extent. Um, the next is the number of shrimp farms that are, are being developed, in, especially in, the, in East Asia, um, so we all can have our tiger shrimp whenever we want it. Um, and you Eutrophication events that you know all about in the uh, in the Baltic. The th final row there, that's the loss of tropical rainforest, um, the amount of land being converted to agricultural land, and the loss of global biodiversity. You've got to admit, these figures look an awful lot like the ones we just saw that describe human activity. Of course, you all are studying at the university. You all know that being able to show a correlation between two things doesn't necessarily show cause and effect. But in all of these situations, the cause and effect has been demonstrated, and the cause is human activity. We continue to find more figures like this. This came last year, or the year before last now, in science. It's the temperature over the last, or the temperature anomaly over the last 2,000 years in the Arctic, you can see that it was getting slightly colder, and no, we weren't on our way to an ice age, but there was a tendency for it getting slightly colder until again we get to this period here of the Great Acceleration, and you can see changes there. So what I want to argue for you is that the challenge of this century, the challenge of your century, is to develop mechanisms to share the Earth's resources among the soon to be nine billion human inhabitants. And in fact, I would also argue that the successful business model will be one of resource efficiency. And Mr. President, that might be, um, uh, might position Latvia very well vis-a-vis -vis the, the comments that you, that you opened with. You ha do have some, some experience in, in working with uh, uh, resources efficiently. Now, if you think about it, our ancestors started on this planet something like 250,000 years ago. And when they started buying and selling from each other, what did they use as their currency? They used natural resources. 
They used food, water, fire, uh, gold, precious metals, stones. Now we've gotten a lot better, haven't we? We're civilized now. We use money. And none of us would use more money than we absolutely have to to buy a service or a product. And yet we happily use far more of our natural resources that are necessary to maintain the same standard of living that we already have now. That has to change because we are almost 7 billion and we will be 9 billion on this planet by 2050. Until now, and now this is for the economists, until now the supply even though we knew the supply of our natural resources at least theoretically was limited. But until now, the supply has been so much larger than the human demand that we could ignore the fact that the supply was limited. This is no longer the case for very many of the resources we're dependent upon. Even this morning I heard on the news Sugar prices going up because of supply and demand. Food prices going up because of supply and demand. We have prob I mean, uh, uh, the, the fossil fuels I'll get into in a moment. Phosphorus for making fertilizer. There are very many of the resources that we, that we are dependent upon where supply and demand or the demand is reaching the overall supply. Another example you can give here is actually, this is a picture showing, where's my pointer? This is um, the, the discoveries of ore, that is to say anything that you mine, um, mining and anything you mine or, or metals that you take out of the ground. And if you look at the red line here, that's the amount of investment. That's how much people are spending to try and discover more. And if you look at the columns here, that shows you how much is being, the number of discoveries, the blue being world-class discoveries, the red being, um, the red being uh, uh, major discoveries. And you can see that despite the fact that more and more is being spent in order to find these resources, less and less of these resources are coming out. Now this isn't just green talk from some committed envir environmentalist. In last month, the World Economic Forum came up with this um, description of the threats that are out there now. And if you look on, the, on this axis here, it's, it's the perceived likelihood or the, the likelihood of an event um, happening. And over here in this half or this third of the picture here, that's very likely that these things are going to happen. On the left-hand side, it's the costs involved um, with this happening. And this is a thousand billion US dollars. I mean, it's an awful lot of money. And if you start looking at the threats that they identify, here we have climate change, very likely and very expensive. Here we have water security. That's another, um, another resource upon which we are dependent and where we know um, that the supply and demand are, are getting close to each other. Here we have biodiversity loss. Uh, air pollution. I mean, in fact, we we use the atmosphere as a garbage dump for our for our our refuse, our our our, yeah, our garbage. Um, here we have ocean governance, and here we have extreme commodity price volatility, such as petrol prices, such as sugar prices, such as chocolate prices. I've been reading that that's also a resource that is uh, is limited. So as there is this acceptance also in the economic community that we no longer can ignore this sort of supply and demand problem for the global resources we're dependent upon. So we're going to have to go back to our original currency, that is to say, the, the resources we're dependent upon. Now I want to tell you about a study that I've done together with a number of other scientists where we went in and said, okay, it's really nice being a natural scientist. I love being a natural scientist. You collect a lot of data, and then you look back at the data, as we did on all those figures that show, ooh, this is going bad, ooh, this is going bad, oh, this is going bad. So you come afterwards, and you look at it and say, oh, boy, we really messed that up. Ooh, we never should have done that. Ooh. But it would be really nice if we could use our science a different way, going forward, proactively, and saying, okay, Knowing what we know 
about how this system, the Earth system, works, knowing what we know, could we use our science to try and identify boundaries that we shouldn't go over? For example, when we go to the doctor, the doctor has a number of, of um, indicators that the doctor uses to see how healthy we are. One of them is blood pressure. And if your blood pressure is over 120 over 80 for any length of time, it will be put down. Why? There's no guarantee that something awful is going to happen if it's over 120 over 80. No, but the risk is much greater if it's 120 over 80. And there are several other things the doctor can use. Could we identify something in the Earth system or some things in the Earth system that you could use like blood pressure? So we could measure and say, here, you know, we're in a good place, we're in a bad place, or this is a place we don't want to get into. So first of all, we had to say, well, well yeah, if we wanted to, if we wanted to figure out that, what, what, what do we know about the Earth system? Well, we know over the past hundred thousand years that there have there have been a number. This is temperature. This is the Earth's temperature um, uh, change, and we know it from a proxy from from oxygen. And what we know is that there were some periods in time where over something like a 10 year period there was a 12 degree temperature, average temperature change. That's huge, massive change. But what we also know is that it's in this last period here, the last approximately 15,000 years, the Holocene, that first of all, for about 12,000 years ago, we humans discovered how to do agriculture and in that way began to control our food supply and access to, to our natural resources. That it's in this period that our species has really succeeded. This is really where we've, we've gone from being very few individuals to being very many and in, in the situation we have here. Now of course I told you earlier that our species has actually been on the planet in its present form for something like 200, 250,000 years. Now that means that our ancestors actually lived through all this. Well, at least some of them did. We know from, from genetic evidence that at some points in time our numbers were very, very small and it's maybe just chance that we actually survived. But what else do we know about how our ancestors got through change of this magnitude? Well, if you start looking at the uh, um, migrations where we know that humans moved around, we discover that they were very much associated with these changes, these dramatic changes. In other words, if the water got up to their knees, our ancestors moved somewhere else where it was dry. The problem on a planet when you're nine billion people, at least a planet of this size, is that there's not really any place to move anymore without getting geopolitical uh, consequences. So our starting point was saying, if we don't want the Earth to unnaturally be pushed out of this this period where our species does really well. If we want the conditions to stay like they've been in the Holocene, what would we need to do? Well, first of all, you have to make sure that the sun isn't going to be some, you know, that the, the, the Earth's orbit around the sun doesn't change anyway, so we're going, working against nature here. And in fact, the people that know something devote their lives to understanding Earth's orbits. Um, say that no, we could expect under natural conditions, we could expect this stability to continue for another 15 or 20,000 years. Okay, that's a time frame we can work with, all right. So there's no reason to believe that nature wants to put us out of this system. So we went in and tried to understand what was it that made these massive changes earlier and could we identify, could we identify uh, uh, things that we don't want to let happen in this Earth system. Now we all know from our personal experience, 
situations where nature changes from one state to another. It can be, for example, fresh water, clear fresh water. Plants in the bottom, like the Baltic used to be. Plants on the bottom, sun coming in. You put in a lot of extra nutrients. Tiny little phytoplankton get in the surface. They make it dark for the plants on the bottom. The plants on the bottom die. Now you take away the nutrients. We haven't done it yet in the Baltic, but some lakes we've done it. You take away the nutrients. Do the bottom plants come back all by themselves? No. Where should they come from? So you've changed the state of the, uh, of the, of the lake or the, or the fresh water from, from where you have um, clear water to, to turbid water. And we call this a, a, a state change where you go from one state to another. Now obviously, from that picture I showed before where the temperature on the earth goes up and down and up and down and up and down, there are different states that the earth system can actually be in. And what we want to do is make sure that it stays where it is now and that we don't tip it into another state. Now, we did all of our analyses, and I won't bore you with them all, but I will say that we came up with nine different boundary points, nine different things that we thought um, we should be keeping an eye on. And in fact, for seven, or, or not keeping an eye on, nine different things that we can measure and say there are boundaries we should not go over. And for seven of them, we actually proposed, obviously it's not anything definite, but we proposed, and we proposed it on the basis of all the scientific studies done, that we looked at the, okay, there's the, there's the average of what people say is going to happen, and here's the, here's the, the um, error that we have around the average, and if we don't want to get into the danger zone, then let's set the set the boundary here at the beginning of, of, the, of the standard deviation we have around the average. So we set a value for all of these, or for seven of the nine. And to demonstrate that this is actually so much related to your demography here and numbers of people, we can go in and here you have the nine around the, e the edges here and the black represents where we set the boundary or where we propose that the boundary should be. And you can see that in pre-industrial times when we were few people and before we really got technology moving, we were so far from the boundary it didn't make any difference one way or another. As we got into the agricultural revolution in the 50s and 60s of the last century, we started getting closer to some of the boundaries. In the 70s and 80s, we went beyond on the nitrogen boundary. I mean, right now, in the old, before humans got to doing their thing in a big way, there's, I mean, 80% of our atmosphere is, is nitrogen. The only way you could make that nitrogen reactive and get it into the growth cycle was if plants, if nature, if biology caught it and made it active. Now humans catch and make active more than biology does. Climate change boundary we crossed in the 90s and we believe as well that the biodiversity loss uh, uh, boundary is also, has also been, oops, has also been um, uh, uh, gone over. Now, I should probably say that your reaction time isn't good. Um, I should also say that, that, again, going over a boundary doesn't necessarily mean that something awful is going to happen. I'll bet many of you, well hopefully not all you young people, but at least the older ones here, I'll bet many of you were smokers once, but you stopped smoking and now your risk of the side effects, the bad effects from smoking are just about at the same level as someone who's never smoked. So it's possible to go to the wrong side of a boundary. If you went to Niagara Falls, there's a fence there and you're not allowed to go all the way out to the edge of the falls. But going to the other side of the fence doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go over, but the risk is increased. So I'm not saying that the world is coming to an end because we've gone by these boundaries. What I'm saying is the smartest thing to do would be to get back on the other side.
Now let's look a little bit um, at the at the climate change boundary because that's what we want to get into now with our with our climate commission. And you can see if we go back 450,000 years and using the data from ice cores and so on, we can get a measure for what temperature was like and what the greenhouse gas concentration was in the atmosphere. Now, the green line is the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. The red line is the temperature on the planet. Now, there is actually a relationship, although there are many people that come to me, um, they think they know me because they've seen my picture on the, on, you know, or something. They, they come to me on the street and they look me deeply in the eye and say, I don't believe in the greenhouse gas effect. Ugh. Okay. I didn't know how to handle this in the beginning, but now I've figured it out. You take the other foot forward, look them deeply in the eye again and say, do you believe in gravity? Because the greenhouse effect is, has been experimentally determined already in 1824. And you can see there's a very clear relationship between the green line and the red line. Until we get to that black line that goes up and down. And that's where, that's where our industrial revolution started. The green line, as you can see, has gone way, way up. Temperature hasn't gone that far up. And it ha it's the temperature is this purple line here. But the temperature follows this black line, which is the combination of greenhouse gases and the particles that we put into the air, because the particles cool down. So the black line is total radiative forcing. I mean, how much of our activities are cooling things down, plus how many of our activities are warming them up. And you can see there's still a very good relationship between total um, uh, radiative forcing and temperature on this planet. So we actually suggested um, that the boundary level should be set at 350 ppm's, and in fact we're up at 387 right now. I should mention before I do the um, the climate stuff or the climate change stuff, I'd like to mention because I am an oceanographer. The climate is exceedingly difficult to communicate. It is correct when people say. It has to do with the, the shape of the, of the orbit around the, of, the, of the Earth around the Sun. Yes, that's correct. It is correct that it has to do with also the amount of water in the atmosphere and water is the most important greenhouse gas. It is correct when people say that it has to do with sunspots as well. There are many, many different things that play in. So climate is incredibly difficult to communicate. But something else happens when you get extra CO2 into the atmosphere. The partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere increases. The atmosphere is in contact with the ocean over 71% of the Earth's surface. What happens when you increase the partial pressure of CO2 in one medium and there's a it, it's in contact with another medium. What happens to the concentration of CO2 in the surface ocean? It goes up. This is fifth grade chemistry, so I'm expecting maybe not the economists, but the rest of you to have your handle on this. Okay, the CO2 concentration in the surface water goes up. What happens when you put CO2 into water? Why is cola bad for your teeth even if you take the sugar out? Because CO2 in water gives carbonic acid. It lowers the pH of the, and it dissolves the enamel in your teeth. And we can actually see in the ocean, this is going back 23 million years, and we can see that the pH in the ocean, that is to say the way we measure acidity, the ocean has not been as acidic as it is now for the last 23 million years. And if we continue to put CO2 out into the atmosphere as quickly as we do here, then you can see what will happen to the acidity of the ocean. Now, this is a much easier story to communicate than climate change or the climate system. I like to say there are only three things that can cause this picture. CO2 in the atmosphere, CO2 in the atmosphere, and CO2 in the atmosphere. And that makes it really, really easy story to tell. The problem is, who cares? Nobody cares. What difference does it make? It still has got the same pH as my shampoo. 
Yes, but there are very, very many organisms in the ocean that make calcium carbonate. They make chalk. And if you go into the kitchen and you take bicarbonate, natron, and you mix it with um, uh, uh, um, vinegar, you put it together with vinegar, then of course it dissolves. So what happens to organisms in the ocean when you, that make chalk when you make the ocean more acidic? They dissolve. It's estimated that by 2065 there will be no regions in the Earth's oceans at all where the conditions are right for corals to make their skeletons if we continue to put CO2 out into the atmosphere like this. Nobody really cares. There's also these little organisms that live in the surface and make chalk that fall down to the bottom and end up being the white cliffs of Dover or Moon's Clint in Denmark. You all know chalk cliffs. That's a good way for the ocean to take up CO2, to keep it out of the atmosphere. And in fact, it's estimated that the biological capture of CO2, among other things, by making chalk and transporting it to the bottom of the ocean is the equivalent if you use the prices that we have in the EU for CO2, it's the equivalent to between 0.1 and 1% of world GDP every year. So the organisms in the ocean are doing a lot for us. Climate change then is really also a resource problem. It's a resource problem or issue for two reasons. One. It's the fact that we are using a common garbage dump in the atmosphere for our CO2, our greenhouse gas waste. It's a global resource. Scientists can tell us when politicians say they want to keep the temperature change, temperature increase to within two degrees, scientists can tell us how large that garbage dump is. They can also tell us it's half full and they can tell us who's filled the first half. So what we're really talking about in the whole COP process in the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, what we're really talking about there is dividing up the rights to the rest of the garbage dump. Now it could be that we, and I'm talking now from Denmark, who have used the first half could come out to the rest of the world and say, okay, we've had our turn, now it's your turn. I don't think that's going to happen. So this is one of the reasons why this is a very, very hard process. I should also just m very briefly say I hate the fact that after every COP meeting, everybody decides to play school teacher and give this COP a grade. Was this a good COP or a bad COP? Now COPs are part of a process. Everyone claims that COP15, that happened in Copenhagen in 2009, was a fiasco, failure, total wipeout. I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong for two reasons. One, in spite of the fact that very many of those people who go mm! about climate change tried very, very hard to convince the world that the science wasn't credible. They stole people's emails. Interestingly, interestingly, when they stole those emails, it wasn't the person that stole the emails who was the bad guy. We don't even know who this person is yet. It was the scientists themselves that were the bad guys. A year later, when WikiLeaks steals emails, it's not, it's not the guys that got their emails stolen that are the bad guys. It's the guy who did the, 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 the stealing. I don't understand. Anyway, people worked very hard to discredit the science, but it didn't make the politicians shake their hand at all. It says in the cop the declaration from the Copenhagen uh, meeting that we will confine our increase in, in temperature um, to within two degrees. So the science was not, there was no question raised about the science. The other is climate change started as an environmental issue and I hate to disappoint the people who study environment but environment has not been considered top political priority. It was nice to have if you, if you could afford it, but otherwise it just isn't really where it's happening. And you don't get political top leaders to come to international uh, uh, meetings where you negotiate environment. There were 135 top leaders in Copenhagen in 2009. 
They didn't come because they thought climate change was an environmental issue. They came because they thought it was top, high politics and priorities. Now, high politics things get negotiated differently than, than low politics. For example, if it's just an environmental issue, when a country comes to say, is there something in this for me? Okay, fine, I'll vote for it. But if it's top politics, it matters a whole lot what the other guy's getting out of it as well. Okay, there may be something in this for me, but if I think he's getting too much, then I can't vote for this. It takes a long time to get top politics pro uh, negotiated in place. Think of, of, of um, arms uh, uh, negotiations and so on. So the COP process is a long process. It was too much to expect to move it to top climate change, move it to high priority politics and negotiate it as high po priority politics at one COP meeting. But there was a major, major step taken in 2009, which I think just underlines the message that I've been trying to send you today. And that is to say, business as usual is dead, and we have to consider our resources and effective use of resources. Finally, we've gotten to what I actually came to tell you about, but I think it's important to put it into perspective. I was chairman of the uh, Danish Climate Commission. The Climate Commission was established in 2008 in order to come with a, it was called climate, but we were to come with a plan for how Denmark can be independent of fossil fuels. Now, fossil fuels, well, we'll get back to them in just a minute. You'll see we had a number of other criteria we had to take into consideration, including the emission of, of oops, emission of greenhouse gases. We were 10 people on this commission. None of us come from business. None of us come from politics. None of us had a, a, a group of people we had to be responsible to behind us. We were all experts. Five of the 10 people were economists. And I hate to disappoint the economists of you here, but I have discovered economy is everything but an exact science. But I am delighted, I am delighted by the um, combination that we had. A lot of people asked me underway, is, is it the right people that you have there? You don't have any expertise in X or you don't have any expertise in Y? You can always go out and get expertise in X and Y. And I will, I would, eat my old hat here to tell you that I think it was exactly the right people also because half of the people on the commission were our economists and, and the fact that we were so solid in our economic approach to this has really made a huge difference on, on where we are. Now let me remind you um, about this resource question and how resources actually play in in terms of, in terms of fossil fuels. Here you see the oil, the producing, the blue here you see oil um, production from existing fields going from 1990 to 2030 and it doesn't require a PhD to see that we are expecting a decrease in production from existing fields. Now that doesn't mean we're not going to find it in the future, of course we are. There are resources out there that we haven't actually tapped into yet, but this is the, this is the um, uh, International Energy Agency's uh, World Energy Outlook. This is coming from, and believe me, these guys are not the most radical on the, on the block. And they say that if in 2030 we're still as dependent as a global community on oil as we are today, then over half of what we will need in 2030 has to come from sources that haven't been found yet or haven't been put online yet. Now, they'll get, they're there. They'll get there. I'm not worried about that. But they're getting harder and harder to get to. They're in deeper and deeper water. They're in the Arctic. They're, that makes them more expensive to get. So we're talking rising prices. The supply and demand are balancing on a knife's edge. So we're talking fluctuating prices, and businesses don't like fluctuating prices. But another problem that worries Denmark seriously is the fact that over half of the known oil resources, uh, and natural gas for that, case, that matter, but oil we'll look at now, over half of the oil resources that are known are in the hands, they're in a few, a handful of countries in the Middle East. 
about 28% of it's in the USA, but believe me, I think the Americans are going to figure out how to use that all by themselves. So really, what we can get our hands on is something that's in a few countries in the Middle East. And I don't care. I don't care that it's the Middle East. Irregardless, I don't know who our friends are going to be in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. If your energy security is in the hands of a few countries, you are extremely vulnerable. And I also dare stand here and put my hand on my heart and say, I know that oil is going to get to a point where it just, the, the supply and demand, is there's going to be such mismatch that it'll be too expensive to use. And I know that for, for several reasons. One is that every year on the global, uh, the, as a global community, we burn as much fossil fuels as it took nature around a million years to, to, to build. Now that is borrowing resources at subprime conditions. And I don't think I need to tell you what happens to subprime loans. I can't tell you when we have to pay that loan back, but I can promise you we will have to pay it back. And people say to me, oh yeah, but it's melting up in the Arctic. There'll be lots up there. We've got no problem. They're going to find a whole lot up there. Yeah, they probably will find a whole lot up there. But what you're forgetting when you say that is the rate of population increase is greater than the rate of our finding more oil. So if you take the amount of known oil reserves, divide it by the number of people on this planet, then you will find that the maximum per person happened in 1979 and it's been going down since and there's absolutely nothing to suggest that it's going to ever start going up again. So sooner or later we all have to make ourselves independent of fossil fuels and Denmark decided to examine the question about whether the time is now, what would it cost and how would we do it. I should also point out that in Denmark, if you look at our profile of emissions in 2008, you can see that something on the order of 80% of our um, greenhouse gas emissions are actually because we're burning fossil fuels. So if we ever expect to make the kinds of reductions that the IPCC and others say need to be there, we simply have to do something about our fossil fuels. So in our commission, we had two equal goals that we were working with. One was independence from oil, coal, and natural gas, and we defined that as simply not using it anymore in Denmark. Okay, we can import from other countries, but we'll simply not use it in Denmark, and we'll make sure that the amount of renewable energy that we have in Denmark could meet our needs if we had to. And a lot of people have questioned me on this, and they say, listen, to be independent, do you really need to get it all out? I drink alcohol, but I'm not dependent on alcohol. Well, I hope you're not dependent on alcohol. But if you have to plan, if you plan your calorie consumption on the basis of your having to have alcohol, then you are dependent on it. So we had no choice but to say, out. We, won't want, we don't want it in our system. As I've said, we don't know when we don't know when we have to be independent, but sooner or later we have to. But then we have the fact that the EU has this target of an 80 to 95 percent reduction of emissions by 2050. Now it doesn't say every country has to do it and all that sort of stuff, but if, if we wanted an 80 percent um, reduction in Denmark, we would have to remove fossil fuels, as I've just showed you. So we started out by saying, well, could we do this, could we do this, even though we don't know when we have to do the first one, could we do it by 2050 if we wanted to? And our analysis showed that, yes, we could. And we said, well, maybe we can do it before. And it turned out that for the heating and for the electricity, we think we could. The transport sector would be more difficult. And it would be more expensive to do it by 2030, for example, for heating and electricity, because you'd have to retire infrastructure that's already, and that, that it hasn't serviced, done all of its service yet. So for the rest of our studies, we said, okay, 2050. How would we do this best and most cheaply to 2050? There are a number of principles that we had here. One, of course, was that economic growth should continue. We could all be independent of fossil fuels next year if we wanted to. We just forbid them, but the country would fall to its knees. 
Denmark is a part of an international community um, that has a lot of, lot of, that means a lot in this particular study, um, partly because of, of competition between companies and so on, but also because it makes a big difference to what this is going to cost if the rest of the world is ambitious on a climate issue, then, then the cost of biomass will be high, for example. And if the rest of the world really doesn't care and just keeps going after the fossil fuels, then the fossil fuel price is going to increase very, very quickly. And finally, in Denmark, our energy is bought and sold across borders, so we have to take into consideration the, the, um, the, the market around us. We didn't want this move to something, to a new energy system to be more expensive than absolutely necessary. We don't want to choose technologies. We want to um, uh, make um, some framework within the, the economic system that, that actually chooses the right, uh, the right technologies at any given time. And finally, biomass gives opportunities, but it's also a major challenge. And I think it's important that you and, La and, and um, Latvia realize that as well. Biomass, in many ways, reminds us of coal. If we close our eyes and think about it, we can pretend it's coal. It's not black, but otherwise, it's just like coal. You can have it in a pile in the backyard, and when you need more energy, you go out, you shovel it in, and you burn it and just like coal, and you get energy. That's a good thing. It, it, it makes transition to the green relatively easy. The problem with biomass is that there is, on the global scale, not enough to feed all of our energy needs on this planet. At the current, at, the, at this very moment, we on this planet use about 470 exajoules of carbon every year, or of energy every year, and about 50 of them come from biomass. Now it's estimated for various reasons and ways that we could probably get that 50 up to 400 by 2050, but that wouldn't even meet today's needs let alone the energy needs that'll be there in 2050. So there's not enough pot potential energy in biomass to meet all of our needs. The same is not true of solar, wind, and so on. There's so much more solar energy, wind energy, wave energy, tidal energy out there than we need that in fact the supply is unlimited and it will become less and less expensive to get a hold of that energy because technology will be better and better for getting it. Biomass can only only get more expensive because it's just like fossil fuels. There's not enough of it out there. So we looked and said, well, okay, we think we know how much energy we'll need in uh, 2050. Well, um, if we set that to 100, what's our potential in Denmark? Well, we said that we could, wind could easily meet our requirements like by a factor of two and a half. Um, solar, I think, is probably going to be better than this, but we were using the, the, price, uh, the price for solar today when we did this analysis. But most important here is the fact that we think that the potential for biomass production in Denmark can only meet about half of our needs. So we would be dependent upon import of biomass if we went only into biomass. We use different uh, prices for biomass depending on whether we thought the rest of the world was going to be ambitious or non-ambitious and the way we arrived at these these prices here for the economists is simply by substitution. What do we think coal is going to be costing us at this time in the future? By the way, I should remind you, speaking of supply and demand, that the price of coal has increased over the last year by 25 percent, and that was before we flooded Australia, so it's hard to get coal out. And it, we all know there's tons of coal, no problem, right? Well, wrong, because the demand is growing so fast. As the Chinese demand comes online, the price is just skyrocketing. So a 25% increase in coal prices this year alone. So these are the two different, just to give you an idea of the kinds of prices that we were using. 
We arrived at the conclusion that we can be independent, totally independent, that is to see no fossil fuels on Danish soil by 2050, even though we will ask for more energy services. Um, we have the technology today to do this, so it's not an excuse. You shouldn't say, oh, well, we can't do it because the technology's not there. Yes, it's there, but of course we should continue to do research because it will make the technology cheaper and better. And in fact, there was only a small additional cost compared to continuing continuing on fossil fuels as fossil fuels are going to become very expensive. More on the costs later. But our strategy has two elements. One is um, more energy efficiency. We think there is still, although Denmark is already very efficient, we think there is still a great potential to be had in heating, appliances, transport, and industry and agriculture. Uh, the blue being um, if we continue the efficiency we have today against our needs in the future and the red being what improvements we think are possible there. Now a lot of people have said to me, oh well you know it's green, we, we can use as much as we want, why should I care? Well there's two reasons. One is the, one is the resource discussion we've already had here, but the other is Right now we have an energy system where we use most of the money to buy fuel in another country and, and it's distributed, that cost is distributed across us all and across time. In the future the fuel of its wind and solar is basically free but we have to invest in the infrastructure to be able to harvest that fuel. And if you are asking for double as much energy as you, and that you actually need for the services that you, you have to have, then the infrastructure has to be twice as big and twice as expensive. So it's important to only ask for the energy that you need. The other uh, leg that we stand on in this strategy, of course, is, is changing the profile of our energy sources. This is our 2008, you can see, this is, includes our, tr our transit, our transport um, sector, I should say, that oil, natural gas, and coal fill by far most of the picture. If the world is ambitious and biomass becomes very expensive, then we think our profile will look like this, mostly wind, um, but still a very large amount of biomass coming into the picture. If the rest of the world doesn't really care and biomass doesn't get expensive, then we think there will be um, less wind and more biomass. But these are, e either way, these are the, these are the, important, um, the, the important sources we'll be looking at. And if the world is unambitious and biomass pre prices don't increase, then we will end up with an awful lot of import of biomass in our system. Now, if the world is ambitious and biomass prices increase, we probably won't just burn that biomass because it'll be much cheaper to use solar and, and wind. But we will use biomass um, in the transport sector, or for the heavy transport, um, for an industry where we need temperatures that are higher than are easy to achieve with electricity, and as a backup to the system that we use. First we use wind when it's there and solar when it's there, and we go out on the open market and we try and buy from you and your hydro and the Norwegians and their hydro and all this sort of stuff. And if we can't do that, then we'll go and use the biomass because biomass is going to be very expensive in the ambitious world. What will the future look like? Well, the future will look very much as it does today, to be honest, because nobody can really see whether there are green or brown electrons coming out of the, out of the, um, the wall. We expect to have a lot of offshore wind and we want to build in um, uh, storage capacity for the extra electricity um, in, for example, our district heating. Right now we have 47% of our heating comes from district heating and we think it'll be about 67 in the future. We think actually that um, growth, green growth, can be stimulated by an early um, transition to a new energy system. We have a strong basis to work on. You can see here that at the moment our um, portfolio, our export portfolio, these are old data, right now our export portfolio is about 13 percent of our exports come from either green energy or energy efficiency. And everybody's going to have to go this way sooner or later. So the better we get at it, the more we're going to have to sell them. Or the better you get at it, the more you'll have to sell them. I said we have the, uh, we have the, 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 uh, the means and the wherewithal, but we still need technological development in a number of different areas. Um, and, and I was interested, I was in Korea with this story a couple of weeks ago, and they're looking on exactly the same uh, topics here for technological development.
What would happen in Denmark if we removed the, the black? You can see we've gotten a bit better since 1990, but we've still got one heck of a long way to go if we want to make the 80%. But we would just about make it if we got rid of fossil fuels. We might have to look more deeply into our agricultural sector. Now, what about the prices of all this? Well, we assume the official growth rate of the, of the Danish finance ministry. And a lot of people come to me and say, you don't really think we're going to be double as rich in 40 years as we are today, do you? I don't know if I do or not. That doesn't really matter. The point is, if I didn't use the official growth rate that the, the finance ministry uses, I'd use all my time to explain why I didn't use the official growth rate. And if we can do it at that kind of a growth rate, we can do it at a lower growth rate. But the, And the other thing, of course, is we are about twice as rich now than we were 40 years ago, so maybe we can do it. But the other thing that's crucial here is that there's almost no difference in doing the, in our GN projected GNP with and without fossil fuels because fossil fuels will be getting more expensive and we will be paying a CO2 price. The difference is actually the equivalent of about three months of development. It's less than 0.5% of GDP in 2050. Now, of course, that doesn't mean it's free. The point is that this is taking all the energy costs over the next 40 years and totaling them. And as I said before, right now we're paying it distributed and we have to bring it together in, 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 in pieces to be able to, um, to get the infrastructure going. But you could look at that difference there, that less than 0.5% GNP in 2050 as a kind of insurance premium to make sure that we can get our, electric, or get our own um, um, energy and aren't dependent on a handful of countries. The the price of electricity will be more expensive than it is today. Right now we pay just under two krona per kilowatt hour. In the future, 2050, but with 2008 prices, we think it'll be 2.6 with, wind, with um, uh, wind power and 2.5 without. Almost no difference, but we'll be using less of it because of energy efficiencies, so energy will fill less in our, in our total budgets than it does today. We came with um, 40 recommendations. I would say they all focus on something we think needs to be done within the next 10 to 15 years to make the right framework for this. They are all robust in spite of whether you go think you're going to go to the ambitious or the non-ambitious world. And I think it's important to say they should be seen as a package because it's not a question of finding one technology and investing money in it. It's a question of building a whole new system. And, and for example, you, if you put in more wind without putting in storage capacity, then the wind is is lost. I mean, you can't really use it. So there are things that have to happen together in order to make the system work. A long list of different types of activities that need to, to happen. We need this energy efficiency. Um, we need more green energy, um, storage capacity, and so on. The most important of our recommendations um, I didn't get to talk very much about because my spin doctor told me he didn't think it was sexy. But I think the most important was actually making the goal itself, making it, making it a it law in some way so that it's not dependent on what government you have at any time and place, but also the fact it gives you the possibility to go in periodically and assess where you are in relation to that goal and all those different buttons there. Do we need to be working harder on this one? If we're not getting the efficiencies in industry in, are we... I understand now from my friends in government that what's happened is we reported on the 28th of September the Prime Minister in his speech to the opening of Parliament stated that this is now the Danish goal to be independent by 2050 and I understand um, that there, the government will within the next two weeks actually come with their plan of what they will do within the, in the coming years now here to which of these um, recommendations, how would they push on all these buttons. If they won't use our recommendations, what recommendations will they come with? So to finish off, if we want to put all this into perspective, this planet we live on has been here for nearly five billion years. Our species showed up something like 250,000 years ago in its present form. That means that we are something like generation number 10,000 of our species on this planet. Now, most of these generations, of course, lived in caves. 
About six to eight generations ago, we replaced animal power with machines. About four or five generations ago, we discovered the automobile and began mass producing it about four generations ago. Now, none of these generations, not even my parents' generation, knew what these activities were doing to the planet that we're living on and then affecting the conditions that we have to live on. We are actually the first generation that knows, thanks to research, that our combined activities impact this planet at the system level and thereby reverberate into the living conditions that we have. That means, I think, that we are the first generation with the power, and I would also argue the responsibility, to change and to begin to manage our species' relationship with the planet in an entirely different way. And that's not just for the sake of the planet, it's also for the sake of our species. Thank you. Thank you for ideas and information you shared with us. Uh, maybe we have some time for questions. Yes. Yeah. Please, floor is open for questions. Please. You said that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> you said that you believe that Denmark will use uh, less energy in uh, 2050. Uh, is that just a feeling, or can you, I don't know, somehow prove it? Because what, from what I know, uh, given the facts that all our appliances have become more and more energy efficient we are still using more and more every year. We will use more, we will have more services that come from energy, yes. We will be asking for more and more. But it has been shown in any number of studies that already today there are a lot of energy efficiencies that we could be putting into place um, that we could save money on and that we don't put into place. And that, you know, that's a market failure. Um, and, and a lot of that efficiency isn't in appliances. It's in buildings. Um, it's, in, it's in the energy system itself. It's also in the fact that we have a system at the moment that we only regulate on the supply side. So that if, you know, when, the, when there's, a, when there's a, um, uh, a pause in the football game and we all go racing out to put on the kettle in order to heat water for coffee, there's a signal that goes outside of the house to that power plant that's just been waiting for the pause in the football game. It does nothing except turn on when you have that kind of extra peak demand. So we send a signal outside saying, oh, send more. And in fact, um, in the future, where we're using um, more fluctuating sources, we can't necessarily only regulate on the supply side. So rather than, rather than the signal as the first stop going outside of the house and saying, send more, looking around within the house, looking around within the house um, to, to say, well, gee, you know, he hasn't been in the freezer for the last 13 hours. That could be turned off now while the pump is going or while the, 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 the kettle's boiling or, or you know, if he's, if, he's, if he's boiling the kettle now, he's not going to wash his hair, so we don't need heating the water. Um, you know, so, so there are a lot of ways that efficiency, better efficient, more efficient use of energy um, um, can be, can be uh, uh, brought into the system and those numbers are there. We know what they are and those are the ones that we've used. We, because of my five economists, we didn't recommend anything just for the sake of we thought it was right. We only recommended things that we thought we'd save money on or earn money on. Um, <clears throat> I agree with you that uh, there have to be some plan to reduce the uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption, but I have heard some uh, I uh, read some uh, research that I don't know how ambition is that uh, uh, wind uh, uh, 
uh, wind parks, how big they're going to be, but uh, the research is that uh, if the plan is really ambitious and you uh, plant uh, wind uh, uh, parks in the uh, ocean, let's say, in a huge uh, scale, then there's going to be even uh, bigger uh, changes in the climate, let's say the uh, w- um, ocean streams or the wind streams uh, or the uh, entire planet, if it goes in a huge scale, then uh, have you heard about, uh, anything about this one? Yeah, um, I have actually. First of all, I think it's really important to say here that you know, I think the EU wastes an awful lot of time and energy talking about having meetings about what the right energy mix is in 2050 because there isn't an EU right energy mix. And it's going to be very specific from country to country. And, and you're absolutely right that if we thought we were going to get all of the Earth's energy from wind, then big changes would happen in terms of, of um, yeah, in terms of well, also heating of the planet, for that matter, and where, where, how heat is distributed. But if you look at it in terms of, I mean, the, the mountain Denmark and England and Germany do together um, isn't going to make that difference. And, and, and I don't think, I think the important thing to remember in terms of green energy systems, well, there are two things. One, there is no right technology, so none of it's going, no, no technology is going to be the winner because when you have fluctuating um, supplies like this, you need, the, need them to supplement each other. So the cocktail that you have or the bouquet that you have for every country is going to look um, different. The other thing is, I'm absolutely convinced that in the future, our major supply is going to be, our human's major supply is going to be solar. But we haven't gotten the technology figured out yet. And a lot of people would say to me, come on, can't happen here in Latvia, can't happen in Denmark, too dark, we'll look outside at the plants. How did they get there? And if nature can figure out how to do this, we're going to figure it out too. So all we're really looking at at the moment is transition technologies to get us through this period where, where we can see we, we, either because of supply and demand or because of climate, won't use the fossil fuels any longer, and, and wind is certainly, um, certainly a part of that, that cocktail. Hello, my name is Anastasia. I'm studying an RTU, environmental science, and I have a question about the society. Do you think that Denmark is really ready to become an all green? The people, I mean, are they, are they really ready? I just don't believe that everyone is ready. Well, it's interesting, and that's a really super question. Um, there are, there are two reasons. L- notice that we had two major um, uh, reasons for doing this. One was climate and the other was simply independence um, uh, from fossil fuels. You have to remember that Denmark started in, 1970, in the 1970s there was an oil crisis and Denmark was completely dependent on oil for its electricity and heat and Denmark really went to its knees and many of the adults in Denmark today remember that they couldn't drive cars on Sundays they couldn't get their heat they were I mean it was and the government at that point made the goal to become independent of oil so they've seen that this can happen now remember a couple of years ago we had an a newspaper that did drawings of Mohammed and that really affected our exports to the Middle East and we realized how vulnerable we are in relation to the Middle East. So a survey was done after our report came out about whether people wanted to be independent of fossil fuels. Now don't discuss green, don't discuss climate, but do you want to be independent of fossil fuels? And nine out of ten said yes, that they wanted to be independent of fossil fuels. But it's obviously for different reasons. And that's something very interesting in Denmark at the moment because the government that we have at the moment does not have the climate votes. I wouldn't say they couldn't care less, but close. Um, But the opposition has the climate votes. So both sides of parliament um, are encouraging this agenda but for different reasons. So it's the fact that you have this combination of, of, um, of resources and vulnerability and energy security and climate that makes it an agenda that, that people do accept widely. Hello, 
thank you for a great lecture. I'm a student of environmental science, and I have a question about uh, wind. Uh, if Denmark is going to be very dependent from in, uh, wind energy, uh, which is very unpredictable, and for example, there is a situation when there is such cold like today in Riga, and there is no wind blowing in northern sea, then there might be a huge problem uh, because weed pumps, uh, heat pumps need electricity, but there is no electricity generated. So, and I know in Olberg at least uh, there is, I think maybe even twice capacity to generate heat as necessary. So, in uh, wind scenario, there m might be just uh, no double, just. Uh, capacity what you need so uh, how do you think you could solve that situation uh, to uh, like to ensure uh, that you have enough heat so okay you can be flexible with electricity but you can't be flexible so, yeah. with heat yeah, super question. I would like to point out, though, that even though the wind isn't blowing here today, I notice that the sun is shining a whole lot. It really is nice out there today. We have in our plan the backup. Um, right now, I should probably tell you that 20% of the uh, electricity in Denmark comes from wind already, and and we think we could increase that a lot by putting in um, by putting in storage capacity in the system. But our system, the, our plan says, okay, first line of defense, that's our combination of, of, of wind, solar, um, so on. If we can't get enough electricity or, or heat or whatever we're looking for there, then we go out onto the open market and see if some of our friends in, in Norway or Sweden that have hydro or even Germany and Sweden that have um, um, nuclear, whether they have any cheap energy they want to sell us. And as the absolute backup in this, we have budgeted with some um, incredibly expensive um, uh, uh, biogas um, uh, boilers that would be have huge capacity but would hopefully only run a couple of days of year because they would be very expensive but they would be the absolute um, back backstop here. So our models suggest that we would be able to take even, I, I, I've never discovered minus 20 in Denmark but if it happened I guess we could do it. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the lecture. I have a little comment first and then come to the question. Uh, so what people have done over the time is uh, we have developed ways how to save life and preserve life. I mean the human life. Um, uh, we've created a safe environment for, for ourselves, uh, medicine, and uh, well, let's not be naive. It's all actually um, that we save people uh, that, well most of them, are not going to care about the environment. They'll care about earning money and just providing their own life. And, um, uh, well, though it's kind of like hoovering, you know. Uh, we clean the dirt, and what, would, what do we do with it? We, we put it outside, and then we go out, we come in, and there it is again on our carpets. And so, basically, my question is, don't you think it's kind of an enchanted circle, and what is that to be done with it? Well, what you're basically saying is you think a large part of this problem is population, and you're absolutely right. Um, but there are, I mean, I think, I think we need to start at basics, and that's why I tried to use so much time talking about um, resources being our own, our real currency. And a lot of the, a lot of the, um, the people who are looking for a higher standard of living than they have today, they already accept the fact that their resources are their currency, and, and that, you know, in, in, in China, you, they, they, they never got the fact, they never got the telephone with the, you know, wire, they went directly to the, to the, to the mobile telephone. So I do think that um, with the right kind of um, um, approach also to our development goals and so on that, that we can come very much farther. We may come to the point, I mean, there are two ways you can do this. I mean, it's supply and demand, it's resources, it's numbers of people. And there's two ways to do this. You can have more resources per person if you have fewer people. But my experience is it's hard enough to communicate climate change and resource problems to politicians without going to them and saying we think they should shoot half of their half of their um, citizens I mean this that's a really 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 difficult topic so let's start by using those resources we have in the most efficient possible way and if it then turns out there simply aren't enough resources
resources per person, then maybe other more difficult decisions are going to have to be made. But, but I, I'm, I'm, I guess you could say I'm starting there where the fruits are lowest, because there's a whole lot of potential for using resources more efficiently than we do today. And you know, I, I think this is where the, the business agenda is going. Our, our largest power company in Denmark, that goes back to your question over here too, our largest power company in Denmark has said that they, at the 2008, they got 85% of their power from, um, from fossil fuels and 15% from green. And they said by 2040, they're going to turn that around. So it's 85% green and 15% fossil fuels. Not because they have to, there's no law saying they have to, but because they expect that their customers are going to demand it. And then people say to me, well, they're only doing this because they think they're going to earn money. And I say, well, well, yes, and, you know, what was the problem there? So there are actually a lot of, especially, especially companies that are multinational that I think are taking this agenda in very, very seriously. And I think in some ways, the business community, the multinational business community, is better placed to deal with global resource issues than individual countries are. And a lot of them are, are doing it. Very impressive. And I have to say, I should say about our, our largest energy company, that they didn't do the simple thing and say, well, we'll have this in 2040 as our goal. They also said, let's make some short-term goals. And they made a goal of going halfway by 2020. And they tell me they're ahead of schedule. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I agree, actually, and uh, w what I wanted basically to hear is that um, that what people need to survive is not in the ground, like basically digging out everything we can get out from it, but working together with nature and that we, we're just, we have to keep trying, because if we stop trying, everything just goes right away down. Thank you. I was interviewed once by BBC and they were saying, ah, oh, but you know, you, they, they named all the old, the old boys that had, you know, original James Hansen and, 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 and the guy that did the whole Gaia, um, they, they say, oh, it's too late, you know, it's doomsday now, we can't do anything, and what do you say? And I say, I'm a mother, I have to believe in the future, but I do think that knowledge is power, and you have the knowledge, we have the knowledge, we just have to change the system. Yeah, hello. My name is Ines Sture. I'm teaching culture geography in Faculty of Geography. Yeah, thank you for lecture. My question is, um, could you give a comment regarding situations here in Latvia? We are discussing a lot about fossil uh, energy, but also in terms of politics, and not so much about climate change, but also about dependency from Russia and, and recently our government came to the decision to build new power station depending on Russian gas and uh, could you give any comment regarding that? Thank you. Well, I have the comment that is that, um, don't get me wrong, I don't think the Danish um, example is the right for every country. I think every country needs to go in and make an assessment, a long-term assessment of, of where their security um, would best come from and whether that's internally or whether that's making political alliances with other countries or, or not making political alliances with other countries, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, and, and I, I was just in, in, in South Korea with this story. Well, of course, the South Korean situation is entirely different than, than the rest of us because they don't communicate with the outside world. Basically, they're an island. So they're going to go very nuclear in this. So, I mean, I, I don't know what the right solution, I have no personal opinion on what the right solution for Latvia is, but I do have a very strong personal opinion that it's important that Latvia also recognizes that sooner or later there's an energy security problem and are the is the tra trajectory we're on is that the one that optimizes our our chances for energy security in the future hello um, my name is Zane and my major is finance but I'm very interested in environmental uh, issues um, I'm very happy that you are here and Sitting next to president is also a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's go to the point. Like, um, let's look globally. Europe is very small. 
And um, I was studying environmental um, uh, resource management in Slovenia. And there was one statement uh, one professor um, made. Um, like, uh, in global, globally, um, USA and uh, Japan and China. Russia and China, not, not in this uh, statement, but they are very big. And they, are, they have their own interest in global uh, change um, because um, the Arctic Ocean is melting and they will have their um, sea route uh, to increase their um, economy. Uh, so I would like to hear your opinion about this statement and what do you think uh, Europe can get something out of it or it's not the... Okay, you're asking a couple of questions in one. One of them is people say, okay, if it doesn't, this happens all the time in Denmark. I mean, we're a little bigger than you are, but not very much. And people say, oh, you know, we can't do anything. And, you know, we're a little bitty country. And as long as the United States and China don't blah, 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 we can't do anything. The answer to that one is, okay, if we're going to be 9 billion people in 2050, and we know how big the garbage dump is up there, then we know if we want to keep the temperature increased to within 2 degrees, we know that every living person on the planet in 2050 can give off on average between one and two tons of CO2 per year. In Denmark today, we give off between 11 and 13 tons per year. So unless somebody has a good ethical reason for why Denmark should be allowed to give off six to 12 times the global average of, of greenhouse gases, then we all have a job to do no matter how big we are. It's a little bit like saying, oh, come on, there's a million people in Riga if I, throw, if, you, if I throw my garbage out of the hotel window, it doesn't make any difference at all. Well, I mean, if we all did it, it would make a difference, wouldn't it? So that's the one side. The other side is the business about the Arctic sea ice. Yes, obviously some people, some individual companies stand to, to um, gain from a sea route there. But I don't think that it's, um, a nas it's in the national interest, and I don't think any of these countries believe it's in their national interest to go for having an open sea route there rather than, um, than I mean, the other problem when you move all the ice there is that right now when there's ice, when the sun hits it, it gets reflected back into the outer atmosphere. If you remove the ice, then the, the heat comes into the ocean and warms the planet even more. And I think, I think, even though it's difficult, and if you have two airplanes that fly into the same building on one afternoon in New York, you can say, that wasn't a natural event. But because you have flooding in Australia or hurricanes in Australia or uh, for the second year within five years a drought in the Amazon and so on. You can't put your hand on your heart each time and say, oh well this is global change, oh well this is global change. But it does fit with the theories of things that should happen. So there will be so many costs, and you saw from one of the slides I showed, so many costs associated with severe climate change that I don't think any country is going to be able to actively go argue that having a route through the Arctic would be an economic advantage for them. Just Iceland. <laughs> oh! <laughs> okay, yep. the professor was from there. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Hello again, uh, it's me Anastasia. So we future environmental scientists, we have a question. So yes, you finished your great presentation, but your computer is still working. So <laughs> we're here and the lights are on. So where is the example of being uh, energy efficient? Why you didn't tell us, okay, we have to turn off my computer because I've already done. Why you can't say, people, let's stay in the dark. Where is this theory? Where is this, I don't know, inspiration? Thank you. Thank you. I guess the university, the university should get take that. It's their computer, so mine would, of course, have turned off. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you, Catherine, <laughs> for your interesting, emotional, and stimulating presentation, answers to question, questions, and uh, thank you to audience for active participation, for coming here in this cold winter day. Uh, for those of you who are coming from other buildings, uh, the uh, student menza is in your disposal uh, downstairs. And uh, Mr. President, we are looking forward to your next suggestions for new topics to be, uh, to be discussed here in, in Aula. Thank you for all of you. <laughs>